again. Uh, now we're not in a Star Trek movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's not linking. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was, uh, I was very much interested in, in how you communicate in interviews, how, your style of politics, using uh, poetry, using song texts, using uh, the Vulcan salute. Um, mm -hmm. Is that an important part of your of, of your persona? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, I think one of the uh, interesting thing is that I call myself a poetician, a lowercase minister, uh, and all this uh, points to the same thing, which is uh, I'm just a random person on the internet, right? Uh, when I work uh, as a minister, I make sure that I never give order or take order for that matter. Uh, and this, again, is something that the early internet through its end-to-end -end principle, permissionless innovation, rough consensus, and so on taught me. Because on the internet, nobody really care about your rank or whatever. People care about the common values and the rough consensus that innovates upon those values. So the way I communicate reflects the early and, I guess, continued internet culture. And was it easy to continue with this style when you mm -hmm. became a minister? I mean, was this is this something that, that Taiwanese people are very uh, happy about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think after 2014, the Sunflower um, Revolution or movement or demonstration, uh, depending, uh, the Sunflower um, event, uh, people generally understand that democracy is not just about voting, not just uploading, you know, three bits every four years, but rather about a continuous high bandwidth communication between people of different positions. Uh, indeed, that's what Dr. Tsai Ing-wen said in her inauguration speech in 2016, from the showdown between opposing values to the conversation between diverse values. And in order to hold such a space, one need to take all the sides. And when one take all the sides, naturally one uh, becomes uh, more like a chatter moderator, right? Uh, rather than any particular advocate for one particular interest, one need to advocate also for future generations' interest and so on. Okay, interesting. Humor over rumor is one of the slogans Taiwan is using in fighting the pandemic. How fan funny can a government get in such serious matters? Mm -hmm, is, there a, is there a limit in how much humor you can use? Yeah, we, we make uh, things fun, but we don't make fun of other people. So it's always about a situation. It's never about a personal attack, which is actually not fun for the person receiving the attack, right? Uh, and so uh, we do have the Q spokes dog. We have the premier making himself quite literally the butt of the joke uh, and things like that. But they're all in good humor, meaning it never uh, make the fun of someone at the expense of someone or some group of people. That's the limit. Okay, that's, it's very hard to imagine in our political situation here that any fun could be used in fighting the pandemic. It's uh, mm -hmm. all very stuffy here at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's very Much serious and, and it is a serious uh, situation. But we use humor over rumor because we must, uh, because we cannot uh, go back to censorship. We even for hate speech, which, of course, the, the German people, uh, you know, uh, is OK with uh, private sector censorship with. Uh, but even for hate speech in Taiwan, it's very difficult to invoke censorship because people would say, um, well, isn't it like going back to the martial law, uh, to the white terror, to the battle days uh, before the 70s and 60s and so on. And because of that, we need to find something that vaccinates people against hate, against discrimination. And the only emotion that travels faster and inoculates against such negative emotion is humor. Okay, very good. Um, fighting a pandemic necessarily is a collective effort. Mm -hmm. Taiwan has put a lot of importance in finding creative consensual yep. solutions. Mm -hmm. How have you managed to instigate such uh, such a collaborations? What what mm -hmm. were your means to get people into the boat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the key here uh, is what we call people public private partnership, meaning that the social sector, the people, set the agenda of what to do. So, for example, when the mask rationing map gets invented by Howard Win Tainan, he didn't have to ask anyone's permission. Not our permission, certainly, but neither the pharmacies or convenience stores permission. He just went ahead and do it. But in Taiwan, because the social sector holds such legitimacy, the public sector always never beat them and always join them. 
So because of that, uh, we, we can't beat him quite literally. Uh, and so because of that, we immediately amplify his idea into an idea that we trust the citizens with. So it's not about making a procurement and inviting Howard as the preferred vendor uh, of a SME procurement or whatever. Uh, instead, we just ask, what does he need in terms of the open API? And we just publish every 30 seconds the mask availability. So not just Howard Wu, but also more than 100 different other people can also make use of this availability to make analysis, visualization, chatbot, and things like that. And all in all, when you make sure that everyone gets the access, then people don't just hold the government to account asking why there is no, I don't know, English or German version or indigenous uh, version. And we can say, here is the open API, go ahead and do it. So that's the co-creative spirit. Mm -hmm. In in Germany and, and Europe, we are facing many, many problems right now in fighting the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Would you have any advice for us? Mm -hmm. What could we do better? It's it's actually funny mm -hmm. that I'm saying this because we have we had all these prejudices about Asians just mm -hmm. copying or recipes, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, around it turns mm -hmm. out that you've much, much better solution. Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't uh, attribute that purely to Asia or whatever. Uh, I would attribute to the fact that we've had this once, right, in 2003, when SARS mm -hmm. hit Taiwan. Uh, we had exactly the same communication failure. We had the same chaos. We have people panic buying N95 masks. The uh, municipal government were saying very different thing from the central government. We had to barricade, lock down an entire hospital unannounced uh, indefinitely uh, and things like that. So uh, the constitutional court called it barely constitutional. Uh, and so we, we had all that, right? So uh, I think the, the difference is that uh, we had institutionalized our collective memory of the very painful and traumatic 2003 SARS into the Central Epidemic Command Center. The communication uh, like humor over rumor, the toll free number and things like that, all codified into the Communicable Disease um, Control Act, the CDCA of 2004. That is to say, the legislature took the time and the budget to make sure that when SARS comes again, SARS 2.0, uh, which is actually literally what COVID-19 is called, right? SARS-CoV-2, that's SARS 2.0. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will uh, simply play the SARS playbook without having to declare an emergency situation. And in that case, then, we would then rely only on the proven, like health IC cards and so on, proven data collection points. We don't invent new data collection points during the pandemic. So people understand the cybersecurity and the privacy guarantees and so on. So my suggestion to other jurisdictions who encounter COVID-19 as their first exposure to SARS is to, after vaccination, of course, do exactly what we did in 2004, which is make sure that all these emergency responses gets codified into pre-approved by the legislature response cycles and make sure that you run yearly drills so that when the next time comes, people still remember very vividly that masks are there to protect you against your own unwashed hands and so on. Okay. Which now I guess I'm changing the order of my questions sure, because it brings up almost uh, automatically the next questions. In, in many interviews, you have stressed that making mistakes is mm -hmm. part of governing. It, it's a yes. natural part of governing. Mm -hmm. um, how transparent mm -hmm. uh, should a government be? Are there limits in transparency? Mm -hmm. it's, it... mm -hmm. Yeah, for example, I, I'm recording this interview uh, and without your image, uh, but with your, your sound, because otherwise whatever I say wouldn't make sense. Uh, but uh, it's up to you whether you prefer this to be released as a transcript because you also write uh, text, right? Or as a video of me, but with the audio of you. So it's about respect. This is about getting the consent of all the people. And for example, if you're asking a question and you quote, you think about an anecdote from your friend, but that friend have not cleared it for publication, then you have all the rights to say uh, when uh, editing and publishing, we just make this part mute because um, my friend has not cleared it. It's uh, their privacy concern. So I think the consent is the most important, whether it's about privacy, about trade secret, whether it's about national secret or whatever, but it must be radically transparent meaning uh, by I default. have a network problem here. Somehow yeah, okay. it's not well, working. You have the full recording anyway. <laughs> After that, that's what the full recording Oops. helps. Uh, you, you don't hear me anymore? 
No. Oops. Hmm. So, uh, is my sound still going through, or I guess not. It's okay. I'm back. Am I back? Yes. Because somehow I got stuck. It, okay. it must be we have so many internet problems these days because there are so many people working in home office and ah, you're you're using a Wi-Fi maybe. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, well, that, that must I, be I it. I told all, everybody around me to stop using the internet, mm -hmm. so I it should actually not get stuck. It, I'm anyway, sorry for that. It's fine. It's fine. So, uh, yes, I was saying, uh, if you have a friend that have not cleared their private details for this interview, then of course you have all the right to ask me to mute for that particular segment. The same apply not just for privacy, but for trade secret, national secret, or things like that. But the point is that radical transparency means transparency at the root so by default if you do nothing then everything is published but you have to tell me uh, which part it's not okay to publish that's what i care okay and about the first question um making mistakes as a part of governing mm -hmm. that yes. is something that people mm -hmm. you'll find probably very strange to mm -hmm. admit into mistakes to mm -hmm. That it's a natural part. It's not even bad to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I, I really mm -hmm. like that about your concept. Well, I think uh, it's how you uh, phrase it, right? If you say, I, I try my best, but I couldn't get it to work. Uh, now, anyone has a good idea or not? Uh, then that's a very natural thing, right? I, I think the easiest way actually to ask questions and get good answers on the internet is not to ask good questions, but ask a question and give a stupid answer. And, and a mistake, that is to say. And then people of all um, professions uh, will then jump on this mistaken solution and say, you've got it wrong and this is the right way to solve it. But if you do not have this initial mistake that's shared with people, then people have other things to do. They will move on to other questions, right? So I think this idea of turning mistakes into an invitation of co-creation, this is what is must uh, in the internet era because you don't know most of the people who have good answer to your questions. So if you're not transparent, Nobody can help you. Yeah, very good. As a digital minister, you put a lot of importance in the design of government mm -hmm. websites. Yep. Interface design is, is not just a, an add-on. It's, it's at the core of, of a Taiwanese democracy. Yep. Um, I, I like that very much because it, it's actually the design idea of, of Bauhaus, yes. for example. The design mm -hmm. is much more than just uh, aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you explain this a little bit to me, how uh, your idea of, of interface design uh, and, and democracy went together, mm -hmm. how this happened? Certainly. So basically, we treat each misdesigned or uh, not that useful or not that accessible um, government website as an invitation for co-creation. Uh, the GovZero movement literally came out of this uh, by looking at a budget website uh, saying that a lot of PDFs to download, nobody can understand it. But it's not the fault of the citizens for not looking at the budget. It's the fault of the design so that the budget is not good to look at. So um, people register G0V.TW and for all the government website that ends in GOVTW, there could be an alternate open source shadow government G0V.TW that builds the same thing, except in a way that's more accessible. But the ethos of GovZero is it's always open source, meaning that the copyright is always relinquished for government reuse. So if their fork, that is to say alternate, uh, makes more sense, then the government doesn't need a procurement order or a tender. They can just merge it back and say, hey, this person did a budget visualization so well, we're going to use it for join the GOV.TW to visualize all the 2000 or so national budget items from all the ministries, which is exactly what happened. Um, and so the initial fork of Skype Zero became, uh, well, the new join website, part of the new join website, which then gets forked again into join the G0V.TW and, and the thing goes on. So what I'm trying to get at is that when we unlock the potential for the citizens to work on government digital services, it turns complaints uh, and protests and demonstrations into a different kind of demonstration, uh, demonstration as in demo, 
as in showing the government how people can do it better. So I think this um, empowers anyone who work on a more inclusive content and service delivery, because instead of protesting, they could actually just make things better. Fantastic. But it also means that you need a lot of talent uh, within the population. You need a lot of coders, a lot mm -hmm. of hackers. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That, uh, mm -hmm. is, is something which is very particular about mm -hmm. Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I think that's because uh, starting 2019, we flipped over the curriculum in basic education. Previously, we talked about data literacy, media literacy, uh, digital literacy. Uh, but after 2019, we don't say that anymore. We say uh, media competence, digital and data mm -hmm. competence. Literacy is when you're uh, reading a newspaper, uh, when you're watching a TV, that's literacy. Uh, it's critical thinking, but you're still in the consumer's role. Uh, but if you're uh, teaching data competence, really the only way is make sure that children curate their own data, produce their own media, become a narrator, and therefore learn important things like checking the sources, balancing the narratives, and things like that, the media framing effect, and so on. And with that in mind, they become active participants even before they are 18 years old. Indeed, on the joint platform that I mentioned, which also runs petitions, more than one quarter of citizen initiatives like banning plastic straws from bubble tea or whatever are started by people who are not 18 years old. So they feel like a citizen. They are a citizen even before they have the right to vote. That's where we get so many people uh, joining because literally that's their civics class assignment or their environment class assignment to measure equality and so on. Beautiful. You seem to define democracy as something which is not simply fixed and finished. Uh, it's rather something organic that has mm -hmm. to be renegotiated, mm -hmm. re renegotiated all the time. Yep. Um, could you please describe this concept a little bit um, mm -hmm. to us? Certainly. Um, my idea is very simple. Democracy is a type of technology. Social science is science. So social technology are naturally technology. In particular, we can think about open space technology, which is a way for like 50 people, 100 people in a room, <laughs> in a large room, uh, to get something useful done. Nonviolent communication, that's a technology too. So there are many, many technologies that make sure that as people, as human beings, we listen to one another well. And if we understand those technology, we can always find common feelings and rough consensus. Now, digital democracy, take this idea of deliberative or participatory democracy and scale it out. Previously, maybe a good nonviolent communication facilitator can facilitate 200 people. But now, by using assistive intelligence designs, uh, we can facilitate 200,000 people. And that's something beyond the capacity of any single human facilitator, right? So to me, the digital is always in an assistive role. And a democracy is always based on this face-to-face uh, -face participatory deliberative setting, but the digital scales it out so that it becomes listening at scale. Is, is that why um, uh, broadband accessibility in Taiwan mm -hmm. is... Is, is yes, the right? definitely. If you don't have okay. 10 megabits per second, that's my fault. Like literally my fault. Uh, it's very affordable, 16 euros per month, unlimited data. Uh, and we uh, really go to a very uh, high place, like the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters, and still there has 10 megabits per second. And so what we're doing here is making sure we're not accidentally excluding people outside of the democratic expression. Because if only some people have broadband and other people only have television and radio, uh, essentially uh, these people become citizens and these people become just residents because there's no way for them to participate fully online. So that's why uh, in addition to digital competence in the curriculum, broadband as human rights is the other important pillar. Okay. Optimism is 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 the overall theme of, mm -hmm. of the next issue of our magazine. Mm -hmm. So it seems optimism has a lot to do with trust. Yep. And how, how does this reflect uh, on your work and accessibility as mm -hmm. a politician? Mm -hmm. um, and, and how does it shape your contact with, mm -hmm. with your fellow citizens? Yeah, uh, I have uh, pioneered this idea uh, in free software community called optimizing for fun. So my optimism is by making sure everyone participating in a co-creation have the appropriate uh, amount of fun. 
meaning that it's not about a mobilization for a time. It's not about a short-term passion. This is about something that we really enjoy doing. And when people enjoy doing democracy, they will get more people into the co-creation process that defines democracy. So for example, uh, I trust the citizens to talk about um, the global goals, the common good, uh, and instead of lobbying me uh, with something that only benefit them, but to the detriment of everyone else. Uh, so I say anyone can lobby me, but the only thing um, I do is I publish every word I said. Uh, and in practice, by applying radical transparency, nobody really lobby me on something selfish, because it will look very bad when it's published. Uh, and so because of that, people tend to only talk about uh, the public good, next generations, seven generations down the line, and things like that. But without this optimism about people's nature of not abusing uh, the office hours and the time that I offer, then we wouldn't even have the first step. So before asking trust from citizens, the government need to first trust the citizens. Okay. You're kind of... Um using of per, of data your your digitalization is is the total opposite of what mainland china mm -hmm. does uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, almost an orwellian uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, way of handling their citizens mm -hmm. um how how important is the protection of privacy even now in pandemic times mm -hmm. how important mm -hmm. is is that to to the taiwanese yeah. government Privacy is all about norms and the expectations that people place, right? So the same action in one setting uh, may feel private, but the same uh, action in another setting with 5,000 more people watching may not feel private anymore. That's the nature of privacy. It changes with the context. The issue with privacy is that too often we see that as a one end of trade-off like privacy or human rights in general on one side uh, and counter pandemic on the other, uh, or privacy on one side uh, and uh, controlling hate speech on the other. Uh, there's many uh, like this kind of zero sum false dilemmas that's posed not just by the pandemic, but also by the infodemic around the world. And I think Taiwan's value is not to say that lockdown is not useful or takedown is not useful. We know that it has its uses. But what we're saying is that it breaks the social norm. It makes people having even less agency than they already had before. And that's what you alluded to uh, in terms of state capitalist control uh, over the surveillance and many other things uh, in the PRC. So I think Taiwan's value is to show that we can counter the pandemic with no lockdown and counter the infodemic with no takedown by making sure that people understand the epidemiology behind both the pandemic and infodemic and contribute however they can because people in the field always understand things more. That's the core of the collective uh, intelligence. So without the collective intelligence, without the social sector, the Taiwan model would not work. But the collective intelligence will simply fail to work if the state starts to take things down, to censor their actions and movement and speech, um, to break things up and so on. Uh, in that case, there will be no social sector to, to, to speak of. So it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you trust a citizen, like Pygmalion effect, citizens become trustworthy. There is a social sector. If you distrust a citizen, citizens uh, will break the rules and they become, I guess, not trustworthy <laughs> by the authoritarian government's um, like point of view. And so both sides are self-reinforcing. Okay. You embody a style of politics totally opposed to the top dog mm -hmm. way of doing yep. things. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is this kind of leadership and governance uh, something that helps us out of the um, political disenchantment? Mm -hmm. Could this mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. a solution? Yeah, I, I think I, I don't fight any particular old system, uh, representative democracy, political disenchantment, and so on. I simply make sure the new system is fun. Uh, and eventually people see that it's enjoyable uh, to share you know, uh, Shiba Inu dog memes or whatever. Uh, and then they, they start sharing it more. And at that point, this is democracy for sure, because people still join together and co-create something that's worthwhile for everyone to do. However, I wouldn't call it uh, traditional politics anymore. 
because people see that this is like the, an environmental issue, a social issue, economic issue, but it's on a per issue basis, not on a per person basis. A lot of the energy that people spend on political uh, investment of energy and then later on disillusionment and then disenchantment is because people focus a lot of time on specific people uh, about uh, the top dog, right? If you uh, get uh, so um, enamored with any particular top dog, then when they become non-top dog, you feel disillusioned as a nature of things. Uh, and in any election, maybe 49% of people feel <laughs> disillusioned. But if you work on co-creation on the here and now, well, everybody feels that they have won or at least not lost. Uh, there's always another round of conversation when people focus on the matter at hand, not on particular people. So I would say that this facing the issues, not facing particular candidates, politics, um, is on a different dimension to representative uh, democracy. And I don't even think about the representatives that much. Okay. You stand for the uh, for the power of diversity mm -hmm. which yep. is also a principle which is very dear to the german green party um mm -hmm. how do you manage to turn what some people might call vulnerability mm -hmm. uh imperfection mm -hmm. into strength yeah. how, how uh -huh. Yeah, how does that work? I, I think, uh, and I'll quote again Leonard Cohen, uh, there's a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in. The idea of diversity is not just diversity, it's also intersectionality, meaning that my vulnerability has something in common with your vulnerability, even though we're vulnerable in very different ways. So by making sure that, for example, I would say um, I have uh, went through the male puberty in um, 90s, three when I was 12, but just a little bit. Uh, and then I went through the female puberty when I was 24, 25 in 2005. I, I'm of course talking about some vulnerability, but it also means that I'm more able to empathize with people, no matter which puberty you went through. Well, I, I'm on your side. So, so I'm on everyone's side in a sense. And uh, my community, Homo sapiens then, is a larger community. And then I can also empathize with non-human beings or future generations more because I'm not trapped into this binary thinking of half of the population different from me, half the population farther away from me, and things like that. So I think um, transculturalism, more than transgender, uh, is uh, very important if one needs to turn vulnerability into co-creation, into strength, by essentially saying, I understand each participating citizen have some blind spot, have some uniqueness, and so on, but that's exactly what unifies us together, because we all have blind spots, and only by control contributing our particular unique point of view, can we actually get the puzzle pieces together? Fantastic. Very good. According to you, citizens do not need to agree on everything mm -hmm. in order to yep. live and work together. The, the concept of rough consensus, um, how, how can you mm -hmm. describe it to us? It's something which I really, really found mm -hmm. fascinating how uh, you include this in your um, mm -hmm. concept of democracy. Sure. Rough consensus, simply put, is something I can live with, right? Consensus uh, means something stronger, something I prefer seeing happen. That's consensus. But if I can live with um, a idea, then that means that I can entertain more ideas. If I insist everyone have to strongly agree with me, especially over the internet, at the end, only people with too much time on their hand wins the argument. Everybody else just go on and do other things, right? So the nature of internet governance, simply because nobody can force anyone to do anything, uh, turns out rough consensus is the, the most we can achieve, the most we can reach for. That is to say, okay, we, we can live with it. We wouldn't you know, uh, kill ourselves over this idea uh, being implemented. So then we go and do useful things. This is called rough consensus and running code. When we have a roughly speaking common value that enables diversity because everyone can explore different solution space. It's actually like the global goals, the 17 goals. That's a rough consensus because it never says anything about how to reach the goals. If it <laughs> says about the particular path to reach the goals, that's a consensus. But the like vague idea, like these 17 things are good things. That's rough consensus. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I, I have one more private yeah, question. Sure, of course. Go ahead. L Leonard Cohen, you always quote the same quotation of Leonard Cohen, mm -hmm. which is one of the most beautiful ones. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I love it. Mm -hmm. 
what other songs and 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 quotes of Leonard Cohen do mm -hmm. you, you like? Ah, uh, sure. I'm such a big fan. I, I found I, I'm this also a, I'm also a big fan. Yes. Um, I I actually quoted other uh, verses too, uh, but uh, rare. Um, for example, um, I would quote um, Hallelujah. I, I quoted Hallelujah uh, in a conversation with European political scientists, uh, saying that, uh, and we're talking about deliberative democracy. And I said, and I quote, "Your face was strong." <laughs> But you needed proof, <laughs> right? uh, and and so I, I think what's important is that Lerner has a way to uh, phrase things so that it has universal appeal. A another thing that I often quote uh, is this uh, idea that uh, longing of the uh, arteries uh, to purify the blood, right? So that's I, I think very beautiful. Uh, I think it's followed by uh, from longing of the branches to lift a little bud. And longing of the artery to purify the blood, and that says something about the life of plant and something about the life of animal. Uh, but uh, Lena phrases such a way that uh, it's universal. Uh, even on Mars, um, these two uh, sentences will still evoke the feeling of the plant life and the animal life. I, I like that so much. It's from Come Healing uh, that I translated the entire song in Mandarin. Oh, okay. Oh, do you do that a lot? Uh, is, is this a, like like a hobby or? Yeah, yeah, I, I really like translating poetry. Uh, and so uh, I translate poetry all the time. So if you uh, like to look at uh, uh, Mandarin translation of uh, my rendition of Palm Healing, it's in the Skype chat. I'm afraid I would not be able to judge uh, the <laughs> translation. <laughs> okay. Mm. Um. I'm, the, the editors asked me for two things. Mm -hmm. uh, they found some photos of you on Twitter, which they would like to use yeah, by Kai Chang, I think. Yeah, of course. Uh, they're in Creative Commons. Uh, I think the Kai Chang photos are not uh, clear for commercial use, though, uh, because it's a, a non-commercial Creative Commons license. But there are many uh, Creative Commons licenses that do permit uh, commercial use. And you can also uh, just write Kai Chang uh, to make sure that he's OK to license the photo. But there's many other selections. I'm pasting you uh, these albums. And each album is tagged with the Creative Commons license uh, that okay. uh, you can use freely. Fantastic. And also, they were asking me if uh, there were some graphs or some uh, some pictures, explanatory pictures for the concept of democracy that we could use. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have sure. something that that you could send us? Uh, sure, also? sure, sure. Yeah, uh, we uh, have this standard slide deck uh, that talks about all the ideas about rough consensus and so on that I just talked about. And I'm pasting this uh, here, uh, actually scrolling to the page that uh, shows the rough consensus also on the chat here. And you can download the PDF. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. How am I going to be able to access to this video? Yes. So what I would do is I will upload this video on YouTube, marking it as unlisted. And you can access that uh, during your writing. And you can let me know after you publish, or now if you already have an answer, whether uh, by the time you publish, it's OK for us to publish the video, or you prefer a transcript. Oh, it's OK to, to use. Oh, uh, excellent. Of right. course. OK. Thank you so much. Well, so uh, for, I just paste the link to, to Skype then. OK. All right. Thank, Thank you so you. much. All right. Live long and prosper. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>